Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I'll give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Rach. She is a podcaster. She's worked in the medical field for over 20 years and the mother of five biracial children, while also battling migraines, mental health, and a brain tumor. So Rach has it all going on. (laughs) Um, I'm excited to hear from her today. So Rach, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. So like you were saying, I've been in the healthcare field for about 20 years, but I grew up in a medical family. So um, you could say that I've known about, you know, a lot of medical things ever since I was little. Um, Going forward, um, about 15 years into my field, um, which I'm an NST now, hmm, now working in the hospital. But at the time, about five years ago, I was working in a nursing home and I didn't know that much about holistic and I got varicose vein surgery, which ended up in neuropathy in my right leg. And I had no answers and I was very lost and I was very scared. Um, And the pain was so intense that sometimes, you know, dealing with myself having bipolar, um, which is under control, it wasn't under control with the pain. And so I was having some very low lows And sometimes wanting to take my life so my children didn't have to see their mother suffer like that. I have the tools to get myself out. Um, Just recently, I had to use those tools again when I was having PTSD from working in the hospital during the pandemic. And um, because of those tools, I'm able to gauge myself and know what I need in that moment. But I would strongly suggest anybody that's feeling those feels, if you don't have your tools, get help. Um, anyways, going forward from those five years to more years, I decided that I had the answers to help me through neuropathy. And because I was so lost at that time, I wanted to help other people. Um, me and Chris, my co-host, are so busy that we wanted to do a YouTube channel, but we don't have all the time for editing. So we decided to push forward in a podcast called Infusion Health. On there, we talk about bringing together holistic. We talk about bringing um, the diversity, but the two two that pair together, which usually are against each other, are modern medicine, so that's your doctors, and your holistic. And a lot of people pair those apart, but we on Infusion Health try not to do that anymore. So what is it that you do specifically in your day-to-day job at the hospital? Sure. So in my day-to-day at the hospital, I've been working there in November. It'll be three years. And I'm at NST, which is an aid for those people that don't know, um, which is right under the nurse. But I love my unit. We work so well together. Um, the doctors, the nurses, and the aides, instead of where in the nursing home, you usually don't feel that. The, usually the nurses are way up here, the doctors are even higher, and the aides are, mm, you know, the, <laughs> the ones that do all the hard work. Um, in my unit, we don't do that. And it's such a blessing to be a part of my unit. But I started there in November, right before the pandemic. And before I could even learn what observation unit was about, the pandemic hit. And so everybody what ended up coming from their knowledge of here to coming down to here and trying to figure out how to work with this and how to help our patients the best. And you mentioned some PTSD from pandemic times in the hospital. So What has the pandemic been like in your area and how have you been managing with the PTSD? I have talked to other people in other cities around America and they had a COVID hospital or a COVID absolutely just COVID unit. And on our unit, we didn't. 
So you would have to go on up and gown down, gown up and gown down, gown up and gown down, trying to clean your body as much as possible. So when you went into those non-COVID rooms, you weren't passing that to the next, you know. So it was always, you know, am I okay? Am I not okay? You know, and I remember one time in the beginning, um, sleeping in my basement to protect my children because my coworker wasn't feeling right, thought she had COVID. She had her mask on because we didn't know at that time in the beginning if we should wear them or not. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we were just so confused and did not have our tools. And um, I, I was such in a panic, emotional panic inside because I'm like, I just dealt with hours with my coworker who now has COVID and now I have to go home. And the thing was, is that when you were exposed in the beginning, they let you have that time off until your test came back positive or negative. So sleeping in the basement. Now, this isn't a finished basement. This is a basement that you don't want to always go into. (laughs) But it was about protecting my five kids and Chris, you know, because at that time we didn't know that, you know, People do die from this, but if you take care of yourself in the best way, you know, you can maybe walk out of it. And I say maybe because not everybody that was properly taking care of themselves were able to. You know, there's a statistics out there that we've lost already a million people in the United States because of this, you know, and... You never know what's going to happen during pandemics. You know, if you look at the history of pandemics, we have the same problem. We just aren't educated enough. We're able to protect everyone, you know. So, yeah, um, ended up getting PTSD from it. And um, doing the podcast at the same time, I was working with a lot of um, naturopaths and um one person in between, in particular, um, is a generational therapist, and she was really helping help me work through all that emotion that I was feeling internally. So, um, I didn't suffer as bad as some of my coworkers did. And that's good to hear. And even when you first talked about the job, you were like, "I love my team." You know, it's you know such extremes of of dealing with work so is your hospital a little bit more back to normal we are a lot more back to normal and we have more tools they have more education we know what we're doing right now and we and when we do it wrong we are able to see that and change it right away so yeah there i mean it is going back to a normalcy but <laughs> i mean Because, um, and I strongly suggest if anybody is not um, vaccinated, to strongly look at it, you know, know your family around you. If they are dealing with a hard illness, then maybe you should so you don't pass what you could have as COVID onto them. You know, not only that, we also know these days that the, the shot isn't always best answer right it's not always going to prevent you from having it but we do know that it's not and if you get it in you if you have the right tools for you you're not going to be in that death rate can i ask if you've personally gotten covid at all through the pandemic i have not personally in the seven people in my house my daughter's the only one that ever got it It wasn't that bad, but yeah, she's the only one. It's, it's crazy how all of that happens. Um, and I commend you for, you know, working through the pandemic and, and being in the hospital. And I'm, I'm glad to hear there's at least some bit of normalcy coming back to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, an upcoming mm, podcast, Um, I'm going to be talking with some people about, you know, knowing the right time to go to the hospital so the ER isn't as backed up. 
but it's also smart to know that if you don't have the answers, it's okay to go there. You might have a long waiting time. <laughs> um, I talked to one person that was in the ER and she finally came up to us after 36 hours. So this is from the time that she entered the building to the time she got to our unit was 36 hours. Um, unfortunately, there was not, I mean, she didn't stay very long with us because in the ER, they're also taking care of you. So it was about trying to get the right diagnosis, get the right medications in you, to, mm, taking care of you in your best. And she ended up leaving about 10 hours later. But... And she's not the only case that, you know, you heard about these kind of things, especially during the pandemic, you know. And, you know, last year we were your, mm, your guys' heroes. And the mm, this year it's like where your enemy is. And um, I'm going to be having a future podcast with one of my doctors on the unit. And it's going to be about being your best advocate because so many people are stuck in that fear and they start lashing out instead of calmly asking those questions. And you can demand the questions without having to demand your presence in that room. <laughs> yeah, a little a little bit of kindness goes a long way yeah. with uh, needing things. Yeah. <laughs> So you mentioned a little bit about some of your own health issues yeah. and differences. Would you be willing to share a little Absolutely. bit more about your journey? So I do have to say that some of my anxiety was also brought up when I found out during mm, towards the beginning of the pandemic that I had a brain tumor. Thank God it was benign, but they didn't know, mm, you know, the first year I had a neurologist and um, at that time, it was just, you know, video. It wasn't in person. The one time that I was able to be off my unit long enough to get in person, I finally asked him, I said, can I see this thing? Because you, mm, the only way you can see it properly is with the MRI. He thought it was in the front. The tumor was in the back of my brain. It was over by the optic nerve and two large blood vessels. So... Needless to say, I did not stay with him, especially after he had gotten mad at me for changing my pill regimen after trying to get a hold of him many times. And I do not recommend you changing your pill regimen unless you know exactly what you're doing. And I lowered it just a bit because the pill that I was taking at the time, it made me just feel like here up, I was alive. I wasn't able to taste any food. If I ate the food, it mm, tasted like tree bark and my limbs were going numb. And I'm like, I'm at too high of a dose, you know, and working with the doctors and the nurses, we were having those conversations, you know, when we're not in between running from patient to patient and they helped me assess that, you know, and that's why I was trying to get a hold of him, you know? So I had lowered my dose and he had gotten extremely upset with me, which is great. You know, if you don't know what you're doing, I understand why the doctor's getting mad at you, right? But if you're doing this as logically as possible, you know, then you you have to have that patient, you know, patient doctor understanding, you know, of where the education level in your patient is. And with those two things, I decided to leave him. The next doctor, I neurologist I had, she had no follow up after the first hmm, session. Went to my third neurologist. Finally, they do another MRI because that was one problem with the first neurologist that I had. Um, I was in the, your first year of finding out that you have a brain tumor. You're allowed to have two MRIs that are covered by insurance. And I was with him for a little over a year and I had only had one. By the time I go to my third neurologist, they're like, oh, my God, we need to get this done now. I get the MRI done and my tumor's growing too fast. So now I have this new panic, like what, what, you know, and um, just to kind of describe to you what the size ranges in mine were. And I've seen much larger tumors in the brain. The, um, the first 
measurement of the MRI was the size of your pinky nail. And then it grew to the size of my thumbnail. So it was just like, oh my gosh, in, in one year, a little over, it had grown that much, that quickly. And he, the first doctor had told me we wouldn't have to worry about it for 20 to 25 years because it was going to go extremely slow. And so then it was getting a team on board to decide if they were going to go in surgically or if they were going to do radiation. The, so I spent the next year trying to decide, and this is still through the pandemic, this is still working through full time at the hospital, still taking care of five kids, dealing with two of them graduating um, because I have two sets of twins. And then, um, just trying to decide. And then on St. Patrick's Day, they had um, me go to one doctor. They had me go to another doctor. Um, the week before, they had me do another MRI because they're severely watching this now. So about every six months now, I'm having an MRI. And so I had this MRI. Two weeks later, I see both the doctors, the surgeon and the radiologist, and they decide, okay, we're going to do radiation. So around Valentine's Day, um, I started preparation on um, St. Patrick's Day. Um, we're getting a little bit closer, so I'm doing another MRI and starting to get my helmet tested and all that. And then on the 30th of March, they finally did, which was a blessing, only one thing of um, radiation at my brain. But because it was only one, it was... Um, a normal one is a series of about 15 minutes. For me, it was about 25 because they were only going to hit it once. Um, and I find out in a couple more months if we actually got it when we do the, another MRI. So what has it been like then in this waiting period until the next MRI? You, The thing is, is that at first you don't know... Um, you, you're you dealing with this tumor and you're like, is it benign? Is it not benign? And then when you find out that it's benign, you're like, okay, um, what are they going to do about it? And then the first year it was nothing we're going to do about it, you know? And then, you know, then they raise your panic because all of a sudden it, you make, you, you feel internally like you should have, you know, been a stronger advocate for yourself. I know in truth, I was being the best advocate that I could be for myself. Um, but my grandma had died from radiation. So I was deathly afraid that I was going to pass away also. Um, the thing is, is that when you know why somebody's passed away and how they passed away, even if it's generational, then you know how to protect yourself. My grandma had passed away from a low potassium. So during this whole time, I'm working on the best way, healthiest way to get potassium up. So I don't have to worry about that when I'm having radiation. And that's like good to have that piece of, I know, something generationally Yeah. Um, to, to have that bit of background. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because when you know better for yourself, you do better for yourself, you know, and um, what we are finding out in my podcast is that just because you have something generationally doesn't mean that you have to have it affect you at the same level that your mother, father, grandmother, cousin, or anybody else had to deal with when you're properly taking care of yourself. All right. Now you've talked a lot about all of the difficulties of the past three years. So what has it been like with the five kids? Well, we live in Minnesota. So, you know, when George Floyd passed away, his life was taken. It was so hard for my kids because in my first marriage, um, he didn't want my kids to be educated in the black education. And like you said at the beginning of the podcast, my kids are biracial. And I felt that it was extremely important for my education, but also for my kids' education. So 
what I did was I watched, I read, you know, I watched the movies, I watched the shows, I read, but because I wanted to please my husband during that time, um, I gave it as a suggestion for my children to watch instead of this is a mandatory, you must be educated in this. So two of my children have always been educated on what the world can do to our black people. And um, for three of my children, they were completely lost and scared during the whole riots time. They didn't understand what was going on. And when, at the end of the trial, when they're coming out with the judgment, my children, all of them, didn't properly understand that this was an unprecedented time, that somebody got convicted for this. History's past are people that were not persecuted for the death or, you know, torment that they put on other people. And I have always tried to teach my kids to think with your heart first, because here's the thing. History in general, don't think about themselves first when some all the trips are falling down. You know, they always think about themselves first. All right. They always think about themselves first and they don't think about the person next to them, you know? So that's another thing that I've seen a lot during the pandemic that we didn't do in my house. We stored enough food for ourselves to last a week or two in case anything went south and we were unable to get food for the kids, but we didn't hoard it. You know, we didn't go into, you know, all the things that everybody else in this world was doing, you know, and unfortunately, my question is, what are you doing now that you have those shows, you know, full of the, that food, you know, some of it's expired and some of it do you need at that level anymore? Because there's still tons of starving people out there. And so then what has been kind of the the aftermath of everything with the George Floyd murder for your children. Um, and since you're no longer in your first marriage, how have things changed? Um, so me and Chris sat down. That's my partner for life. I love him so much. And he's always wanted to be educated. In fact, before Tulsa, Oklahoma was, announced to the world, me and Chris had went to go visit Tulsa, Oklahoma, because I had told him about what happened to Black Wall Street, and he was uneducated in that. And my children since then have been become more educated in what is the need in this world and the education that's required out of them to protect themselves. And that's so sad. I have a son that is 6'3", about 280 pounds, and I have to tell him to protect himself when a cop is pulling him over, when a cop is questioning him. And we had a mm, cop on our podcast. We're not against the cops. We just think everybody needs to be better educated and take a breath, your personal breath, and like, evaluate in your head is this what I'm doing in the right moment is it the right thing to do and that's completely understandable and for you to say that about you know having to tell your child like this is how to protect yourself so has the like throughout their lives has raising biracial children been like that situation I don't want to say it's been like that when I was a teenager, I was pulled out of a car. My children, of course, weren't with me. I was a teenager, right? But I was pulled out of a car by four cops. Me and my friends were just going for a ride. Somebody else had, you know, said we had a gun in the car, but we all got pulled and put in the middle of the street. And that is one thing that surprised one of my daughters. She's like, why are you such an activist? And I said, because this happened. And she's like, oh, my God, because it's that life that you had before your kids. And then they become announced to what your life was, you know. And when she understood why I was an activist, that's when she started educating herself more. 
you know, and with Chris, you know, it sucks as a white woman. It sucks because I know personally when I'm riding by myself and I get pulled over by a cop, I can fiddle in the car and try and find everything that that cop's going to ask me. And when the kids were little, I was able to do that. But like I said, I have a 6'3 foot son in my car now. They're not looking at as my child anymore. And my children are 24, two are 18, and two are 16. They don't look at them as little kids anymore. So when a cop pulls me over now, with her, mm, whether I have Chris in the car or one of my children, I keep my hands visible. I keep the situation as calm as possible. And that sucks because nobody should be feeling that. No one person should ever feel that. And it's it hurts me that I had to tell my daughter, who has a masculine physique and short hair, to make sure she wears earrings. So they don't mistake my daughter as a male. And what kind of nonsense is that? That I have to teach my kids how to protect themselves. And I'm not the only one in this world that has to do it. So you mentioned that you are an advocate. And obviously, like, your passion is is pulling through with your children. What are the various things that you are an activist for? I have a closing in my podcast and I think it explains myself so well because well I'll just tell you history is born on lines of hate on here we're trying to make lines of love and teach you guys how to be your best advocate now that is for a wide wide range of injustice you know The one thing that we haven't talked about yet is that my children are on the LGBTQ spectrum, you know, and it scares me with the road versus Wade, you know, because what's next, you know, because these, I had a podcast with Unlearn 13, Um, she's a known TikToker, and what we talked about was you know, those, um, <clears throat> I love how she described it so well. Um, it's those gumballs that you get out of that sh- machine when you were a little kid, right? And when you eat it now, the memory of now versus then, I mean, seeing that little ball spin down, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get some gum, right? And now it's like, oh my God, I'm eating cement. <laughs> <laughs> Right. But here's the thing that people don't understand that are standing on the right side of human justice, human kindness, is that they're stuck in this nostalgia of what things used to be. You know, it's not truly great back there. You know, you can take those tips and tricks and tools and bring them to these days, which you appreciated, with still having human kindness and appreciating people's rights. Because your rights don't have to be forced upon them. Now, obviously, you are accepting of your children um, and supporting of them. So what was it like for them to tell you that they are on the LGBTQ part of that family? My kids have never been afraid of that, but I understand why some kids are. You know, some kids take their lives because they're so caught up in that fear that they don't think even their mothers will hold them when they tell them their truth and that's so so sad to not know you have anybody to love you for your true self so my children have never had a problem with telling me you know um my daughter says she's a furry which i i'm kind of get, trying to get around that <laughs> but but I mean, I mean the way they they choose to love is their right to choose to love um i i was joking around with my daughter who's bisexual and 
she thrashes herself around in her bed when she sleeps. She's a very violent sleeper. She's ended up breaking a bone in her foot before because of this. And I said, you know what? Whoever you choose to love in the future and have in that bed, I'm going to get them one of those blow up sumo costumes so you don't hurt them. And that's truly great to be able, like, to provide that space for your children, for them to not have to worry. Like, it it shouldn't be a feat of accomplishment that that is such a good thing. Um, But hearing that it is for you and your family is is so important to Mm -hmm. for other people to hear to know, like, yes, this is okay. Now, I'm going to tell my truth, and I don't always get along with them. I don't. You know, it's five kids. You're dealing with five different personalities and pray that they listen to you because before it was mommy, 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 I love you. And now it's mommy, 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 you're wrong. (laughs) But one thing in those moments of having a really hard time with my children that I promised myself when they were young was I would search out that child that I'm having the most problems with And I would go spend time with them. Now, sometimes we didn't have the money. We, when I decided to leave my husband, we were already living below poverty at that time. And with Chris, he works so hard. I have 18 jobs. Chris has about 21. We're both very hard workers. But we were living below poverty. So sometimes those moments with spending time with that child that I'm having problems with was going for a walk. You know, going into the car, telling everybody else to get out and just having that moment of what's going on with us. You know, and it's not a moment of judging what's going to come out of that kid's mouth. It's a time to understand so you don't have that block anymore. Um, my daughter, Maxine, some of her friends have, be, mm, have told her, oh, your mom's so intense. How do you deal with her? And she's like, I don't care if I'm not getting along with my mom in this moment. You will not disrespect my mom because she's been amazing raising us five kids and just fighting for us anytime we need her to. And that's so important as a mom. So what is it like having two sets of twins? That was a fun one. Um, So I didn't go to the same hospital mm, for each of them. I had ended up moving. And so when I found out that I was pregnant with my second set of twins, they were just doing ultrasound because... um, In my first pregnancy, my son's um, umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck when it came time to give birth to him. And then I found out that I was pregnant with a girl. So both of those are very high-risk pregnancies. So they wanted to check on the third pregnancy. Now, granted, this hospital didn't know me. So they're doing the ultrasound before they decide what doctor I'm going to. And the person that's doing the ultrasound is like, oh, you're having twins. And I'm like, I'm doing this again. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but it it's been very interesting watching them grow because here's the thing a lot of people don't understand when you have twins when they're identical it's a male's fault when it's fraternal it's the female's fault it was all my fault <laughs> And the first set of twins, I have two daughters and both of them are complete. I mean, even looks are completely the opposite of each other. And then the second set, I have a boy and a girl, which, of course, that means that the for, they're fraternal. It doesn't mean how close they look, look alike, which was funny because when they were a baby, I'd be rolling into the store and they're like, oh, so cute. You have twins. And I'd be like, yep, I'm having, you know, having another set of twins. And when the second set was born, they looked a lot alike, unlike the first set. And they're like, so are they fraternal or are they identical? And I said, well, they're fraternal. And they're like, how? They look so alike. I said, this is a boy and this is a girl. And they're like, well, how's that? I'm like, this is a boy and this is a girl. (laughs) 
<laughs> so, yeah, it's been interesting watching them grow. And I think the pandemic and everything has definitely took a toll on my eldest set of twins, um, my eldest set of twins, the firstborn, um, because she's lost in what her next step is. She hasn't realized her power that, yeah, you know what? The first year when you couldn't go to school, you got sick in that bed and didn't do your homework. But the year that she graduated, she did two years of credits in one semester. And she doesn't realize that power. She just realizes, oh, my God, I failed. And I'm like, you didn't fail. Who does two, two years of credits in a semester? You know, and one day she will realize her power. It took me a re- while to realize my power. I was a very, very quiet child that just observed everything. And now my kids are like, nope, you're not that way. You'll talk to the stranger right in front of us trying to get the milk. <laughs> <laughs> but I've, I've realized my power and I hope that one day she will. And it sounds like overall you do have a great relationship with your children. And if things aren't working, you know, you you get it to a place where it is better mm-hmm. and and understanding. Yeah, I really try. Um, I grew up in an abusive home. My dad was like diagnosed with bipolar. My mom was the victim of that abuse. So were me and my sister. Um, and because my mom was the victim, I was the eldest. She also took it out on me. Um, now I have a great relationship with my father, um, because he was diagnosed and he is taking care of himself, but my mother is very narcissistic. So I've always looked at myself and as what kind of mother am I being in this moment? I haven't always made the right choice, but I always try to make the ending the right answer. That's a really good way to look at it. I like that mindset of the ending being the right answer. Mm -hmm. It's so important because it's generational, right? You grow up with an abusive parent or an alcoholic parent or a non-existent parent, whether they're in the house and they ignore you or whether they're just not present. They're not there. And you carry that on to the next generation your babies and how do you choose in that moment to break that cycle because it doesn't have to carry on you know educate your children with the absolute truth and love them as much as you can there's a saying from dr phil i can't be my parents i can't be the parent that i want to be i can only be the best parent in that moment that i can be Were you ever afraid that you were going to be like your parents? Of course. I I mean, even today, I kind of wonder, you know, am I making the right choice in this moment? And like I said, I don't always make the right choice, but it's a conscious effort that a parent makes. You know, life is so crazy and goes so fast. You know, you have to make, I mean... I always question myself, am I being the right parent? My youngest daughter, for the longest time, me and her would butt heads until I found out that she was determined in the wrong direction because we tried positive reinforcement. We tried negative reinforcement and we weren't figuring out how can we get her to center herself to go in the right direction? And it's a joke between her and me now because we do get along. But before that moment of getting along with her, I said, if I ever pass away, this is what I said to her sisters. If I ever pass away before your sister and me get along, tell your sister I always loved her. Because even in my last day, I don't want my children to think I didn't love you. The relationship is not always on the best track. But I don't want them to ever think when the cards are down and they are terrified that they can't come to me. 
That's so important for them to hear. And I'm glad that you've, you've shared that here as well. Now, before I start to wrap things up, is there anything else that you would like to share with the listeners? Um, I think I covered a lot of it. Um, of course, listen to my podcast, <laughs> Infusion Health Podcast. Um, but also, you know, what is your heart mission, you know, um, for everybody out there? What is your heart work? Because we get so caught up in the day-to-day -day stuff that we're like, okay, if I don't work, I'm not going to be able to pay my bills. Me and Chris realized that, and that's why we work 21 jobs, but he's trying to get a business going while he's working those jobs, and I'm trying to get this podcast going. You know, you don't have to end your heart's work just because you have to put food on the table and make sure there's a roof over your head. Yeah, it's hard, and government doesn't make it easy. But, you know, you make the small steps. And my fiancé, Chris, said it best. Um, if you asked him when he was walking on the streets, if we'd be living in Chanhassen. And then the people that don't know, Chanhassen is kind of, mm, you know, a more expensive neighborhood to live mm, town to live in um, over the Twin Cities. He never thought that. I never thought that. You know, growing up. Um, Chan has was thought of as a community that you'd never be able to enter because you don't have the right kind of money. But hard work, slowly by slowly, you know, then then you do. And it, the government systems don't have to take you down. That's great to hear that you've you've gone from something that you never thought would have happened to, to being where you are today. Yeah. And always keep, you know, um, if you don't make a vision board for yourself, keep a vision board in your head. And for those people that don't know what a vision board is, it's things that you want to foresee happen in your future. Now you can't just put that image in there and say, yep, I want a great house and not work for it. <laughs> I mean, seriously, let's, how is this going to end up in your lap, right? You're not going to win mm, the lottery, you know, unless you have a, a surefire way that somebody's going to pass you that money, you're not going to get it without that hard work. So um, if you don't have a visual um, vision board, then have a visual vision board in your head. That's great. Now, at the end of every episode, I do ask all of my guests a random question. My question for you is, what is your favorite memory with your family or a favorite family vacation? Kind of like, what is the first, like, biggest moment that you think of when I say that? Me and Chris like to go on vacation a lot. And my children were like... Oh my God, you guys always go on vacation. And for my children, me and Great er, and Chris are good photog er, photographers. So for me and my er, um my first set of twins graduating, we went to Colorado. Now, unfortunately, in Colorado, um, the wildfires were going crazy. And I they like about three years before me and Chris had went. And it was beautiful. You know, those mountains are just so freaking gorgeous. It's a, it's a landscape to remember forever. And we get to this B&B and this B&B is absolutely gorgeous. And my children are just so disappointed that we spent all this time in this car. And this is such an ugly view. <laughs> <laughs> and it stinks. And I have to wear a mask, not because we have to protect each other from COVID, but because we have to keep the smog from getting down our throats. And my kids are just like having a problem with it. And they get into the house and they're happy. The next day, me and Chris are going up into the mountains and the kids are like, I don't want to go there. This is ugly. Why did you ever take us here? We go up to the mountains and the kids still remember how gorgeous to just get away from those winds and that air of the wildfires and actually see how beautiful nature can be. Yeah, that's probably my favorite one. 
All right, that brings this episode to a close. Of course, I will be leaving a link to Rach's podcast in the description. So feel free to go check that out and see all the good work that she is doing over there. And of course, if you would like to connect with the podcast, our website is in the description as well. That brings you to all of our past episodes, all of our social media, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and anything else that you could possibly want from anything of these past podcast episodes is there in that link. And of course, if you would like to support the podcast monetarily or connect with me to be a guest or leave feedback or anything like that, those links are in the description as well. So thank you so much, Rach, for spending time with me today and to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next time. Bye. Bye.